thank you everyone who's joined in today. I really appreciate your time and, and hope that this can be a productive time for all of us as we spend some time talking about R and Plumber together. Uh, as Robert mentioned, my name is James Blair. I work as a solutions engineer for our studio and we're joined on the line today by Barry Schlerke, who also works um, here at our studio and is the primary maintainer of the plumber package and is here to help with questions and, and provide some, some support that way as well. So we're grateful for his presence as well as we get started today. Uh, our topic today is expanding our horizons, integrating R with plumber APIs. The idea here is I, I'm hopeful that this really is an opportunity for if you've never been exposed to Plumber before, I hope you find something that's useful. And if you've used Plumber in the past and have come to kind of see what's new with Plumber, I, I also hope that there's something useful. So the ideal state here is that everyone walks away with something that's beneficial for them and, and that, that they feel like they've learned. Uh, just to kind of give you an idea of what we're gonna do today, first I wanna set the stage with a problem that we're gonna look at to, to, to kind of frame the conversation that we have. Uh, and then we'll have a brief discussion about what an API is in case you're unfamiliar. Uh, and then we'll talk about how you get started using APIs with R and the Plumber package. Uh, and then we'll spend some time discussing some of the new features that have been recently released in the latest CRAN version of Plumber. Uh, and then finally, we'll conclude by looking at different ways that you can deploy these APIs so that they can be widely utilized either inside of your organization or by a broader audience. And then at the end, I'll provide some links to additional resources. And, and like Robert mentioned, this is being recorded. Uh, today's October 28th, 2020. So if you're watching this recording down the road, um, things may have changed in the in the plumber package. And, and I'll show some links here at the end that can make sure that you stay up to date with the latest changes and things like that. But um, resources will be provided if you if you want to learn more. Uh, today we're going to work with a data set. This is the Palmer Penguins data set. Um, if you're unfamiliar, this is a, a fairly kind of recent to the R space data set. Uh, you can find some more information at Allison Horse GitHub re repository that I have linked here in the slides. Uh, but basically the idea here is we have 344 different observations for three different penguin species, Chinstrap, Gentoo, and the Sedeli. And these different and, and this is if you're familiar with kind of the iris data set, the, the typical kind of classification data set that you often see. This is a similar style data set, right? Fairly easy to understand. Down here on the on the bottom right hand corner, you can see kind of a preview of what this data looks like. We've got the species, the island they came from. Then we have some different measurements from each of these different penguins. Their bill length, bill depth, flipper length, body mass. Uh, and then we have the sex of the penguin and then the year that the measurement took place. So what we want to do here is just kind of frame this. And, and this could be any data set, right? This isn't the, the example that we walked through today is not specific to this data set by any stretch of the imagination. But I think like most most data science, most analytical problems or projects start with some data. And that felt like a natural place to start today. Let's start with some data and 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 go from there. So what we want to do now is we, you know, we'll say we've been handed this data and, and we're going to go ahead and we're going to do the data science or in some cases, you know, that means build the model. And we're going to take this these 344 observations. This is not a a model building or necessarily you know data science themed webinar so this is not about how to build the best model possible this is just let's work with an example that that's easy for us to understand so we'll take the data you know we might explore it clean it up a little bit and then we'll fit this model to it and the idea here is given some set of measurements so given the bill length the bill depth the flipper length and the body mass we want to predict the species of that particular penguin Right, and so that's what we've done in, in the example that we have pulled up on screen. We fit this model using the tidy models framework, uh, and then we're able to see some output from that model. And now that we have this, we can generate new predictions, right? We can, given a set of new data, maybe we get a new set of measurements from a penguin of unknown species, and we wanna predict what the species of that penguin is, we can pass those new values through to the model and generate a predicted outcome in terms of what species we, we think is, is that penguin is likely to be. Now, this is all great, but the question now is kind of, well, now what, right? We we have a couple of options. Now that, now that we've done our work, we've built this model, we have a few options ahead of us. One is we can just kind of ad hoc score new penguin predictions whenever we receive new data, right? So maybe once a month we get an email from researchers that are off researching penguins and they send us their new set of data and we run that set of data through the model in order to predict the species of these new measurements. Um, that works, right? But maybe we want something that's a little bit more real time. Maybe there's maybe measurements are happening at a pretty rapid rate, and we don't want our entire day job from here on out to be 
predicting penguin species using the model that we built, right? But we also don't want the model that we built to just kind of wither away and die. We spend a lot of time here. This was something that we feel like contributes to the, the goals of our business or the goals of the project that we're working on. And we wanna make sure that it continues to contribute in the best way possible. But the problem is we're kind of stuck because we either have to be the ones that generate new values and new predictions because we're the ones that built the model and we know how to use R, or we have to find somebody else that knows R and can do that themselves, right? So we maybe we email them or we provide them with access to the model and they're able to generate their own predictions. But that's still kind of a high bar because that means that that person needs to be able to open up an R session and load our model and load the data and run the data through the model, which if you're an R user, that's probably not that big of a deal. But if you're trying to teach one of the business users or one of the end users of your model how to run this and you've got to teach them about R, now all of a sudden, this becomes a much larger task. The other option is we could just pass this off to somebody else. We could say, okay, we've done our job. Here's the model. Here's kind of how we set this up. Now let's let that model grow up, quote unquote, and we'll give it to an engineering team and they'll reconstruct this model in a framework that they're using so that it can be used for real-time scoring or real-time predicting of new data. And that that's a totally valid option but it's often a little bit tricky to get that right, right? It, to be able to hand off the model in that way, it's time consuming. It can be, it, you know, it, it can be a difficult process to go through. When in reality, we, we already have everything we need. What we really need is just a convenient way for other people to be able to use our model. And that's really where APIs come in. So let's, let's take a, a, a step aside from the model for a moment and let's just talk about this notion of, of what an API is. And in general, the, an API stands for Application Programming Interface. Now, that can mean a lot of different things. And in different contexts, the idea of an API can mean different things, which makes it a little bit difficult to understand. And so for the purpose of our conversation today, we're going to narrow in on this definition that we can, that, that an API is a, a web API communicating over HTTP. Um, and basically what that is, is that provides us with a standardized way for different com for different computers to communicate with one another, right? And, it's the, and I'm not going to dive into the nitty gritty details of what makes up an API request and what a response looks like. There's lots of different features involved here that that you can look into and that and that will provide some resources that that provide some detail there. But the main idea is when we talk about web APIs over HTTP, which is what we're going to talk about today, this is just a standardized set way for different computers to communicate. Just like I'm communicating now through my voice um, and, and you're able to understand, computers have their own way of communicating. HTTP web APIs is one of those mechanisms for communication. The idea is there's a client that sends a request. That request meets the standard of what the, the server is expecting. And then a server receives that request and then generates some sort of a response. And that response could be something as simple as I received the request. That's all. That's all I need. That's all I need to do. To something that's much more complex, like firing off some sort of process, or updating a database, or generating predictions against a model, or any number of different things can happen in response to a request that comes in. But the server is responsible for taking the request and doing something with it, and then providing a response. And even if you've never really interacted directly, knowingly with APIs in the past, um, it's, it's interesting to note that anytime you use a web, a web browser, so if you use Google Chrome or Safari or Brave or Firefox or anything like that, and you visit a website, there's, a, there's a, a request that your web browser makes to a server that says, hey, I'd like to view this web page that's, that's at this address. And the server responds with typically a bunch of HTML that your browser then renders for you to view. So anytime you view a website, you're really interacting with APIs, even if you don't acknowledge that fact, right? Your computer is a client and it's sending a request and there's a server somewhere that's responding to that request with some HTML that you view as the web page. Now, this is again, not meant to be a comprehensive overview of what APIs are or how APIs work, um, but this hopefully sets the stage and gives you a little bit of background. And the next general question I think that makes that, that makes sense to ask here is, okay, well, that's that's great, but as an R user, as a statistician, as an actuary, as a data scientist, as an analyst, why do I care, right? Why is this something that's important to me? And I think there's kind of two 
reasons here that, I, that this becomes significant. And it goes back to our initial conundrum where we've built this model and we want to give people access to it, but we don't want to train the whole company on how to use R, right? And the fact is APIs allow the work that you do to be used by a wide range of tools and technologies. And that, and that, that, that's no longer, no longer limited to just the R language, okay? So I can now essentially say, okay, I've got this model that we're gonna work with, and we'll walk through an example of this in just a moment, but I got this model here, um, and I've got another team in my organization that's using Python, or they're using C Sharp, or they're using JavaScript, or they're using C++, or they're using any number of tools, and they wanna use my model, well, APIs allow me to do that in a very, very straightforward and easy way so that I no longer need to hand off my model to be rebuilt by another team in another language, but instead they can just communicate directly with the work that I've done via this, this web API. And this again, the idea here is this dramatically reduces the handoff between the work that, that you do in R and other tools that are being built within your organization by teams using other languages or other technology frameworks. So with that kind of in mind, let's talk briefly about how Plumber works and how Plumber creates this bridge between our users and developers and other tools and technologies. Here's an example of a, a Plumber API over here on the left-hand side of the screen. And I want us to, I'm gonna walk through some of the core components here. But before I do that, if you just take a step back and ignore the comments, right? So if you just ignore the commented lines of code or the commented lines in this R code, it should look pretty straightforward if, if you've written R code before. We've got a couple of functions that we define and we load the plumber package at the top of this, of this script. And if I look at these functions, there's nothing that's terribly you know, interesting or different about them. If I look at the, the first function over here, uh, it takes a single parameter message and then it returns a list just that verifies that it received the message essentially, right? It returns a list that says, okay, the message is and then it echoes back that message. My second function here doesn't take any arguments, and instead it just returns a histogram of some random values that I drew from the normal distribution. So it's pretty easy to reason about what these two functions will do, right? Function one is gonna echo back whatever I give it. Function two is gonna give me a random histogram of some values. Now, the real, I think the real magic and the real power of the plumber package is how it allows me to go from these simple R functions to a responsive web API in just a couple of comments. And that's where these comments come into play. So if you focus on what I have highlighted here in this box, you'll notice that these comments look a little bit different than standard R comments. I've got the, the pound symbol or the hashtag symbol. That's what is typically used to comment things in R. But then I follow that with an asterisk. And that indicates to Plumber, hey, this is a special comment that provides instructions for what Plumber needs to do. And so I can see, for example, if I take this first comment, I give it this API title tag. And I know that because it starts with the at symbol and then API title. And then I give the API some sort of a name, Plumber example API in this case. And then the next comment block, these three comments following, describe how Plumber should use the, the function that comes afterwards. So it, first comment here tells me, uh, gives a description of what this function is going to do. It's going to echo back the input. My second comment here describes the parameters of that function. So in this case, I have a single message parameter. That parameter is the message that I'm going to echo. And then the final line here is perhaps the most important because it defines both what types of requests this will respond to, as well as what path this particular function is listening on. And so essentially what this says is, okay, if I run this as an API and I make some sort of a request to the echo path, you see this slash echo here, then what I'm going to get back is I'm going to get back the response of this function. I mean, whatever this function does, that will be returned to whatever client makes a request at this echo endpoint. And, and to, to be even more specific, that client will make a get request, which we've denoted with this get tag here. So the idea is I write standard R code as functions. I use these special comments to identify how Plumber should handle those functions. And then I run the API or I plumb it, right? And, and you can see here 
in this little screenshot, I've got this run API button. And in practice, what this looks like is this. I click run API. I'll get this nice little window that pops open over here that shows me the API running. And then I can try this out. I can say, okay, here's my, my message is hello world. I'm going to go ahead and try that out. And if we scroll down, we can see that the output of that message is the out or the output of that of that execution is the output of the function that I wrote in R. Okay. So again, if I look at this, try this out, write my message, hello world. And then here at the bottom, we'll see some JSON that comes back that contains the output of my function message. The message is hello world. And it really is that simple, right? Now what I've done is I've taken my functions in R and I've made them so that they're easily accessible from other tools and other frameworks. So let's actually take a look at this and let's consider our, our original kind of situation here. We've got this model that we built using the, this Penguin data set. And what we want to do now is we want to see, okay, is there a way for us to expose this model so that others can interact with it? Is there a way for us to essentially say, okay, what if a client makes a request with new data? Could we just respond with the predicted outcomes? Could we just respond with the predicted species given that request and, and do that automatically so that you know, if, if somebody you know, in another department has a Python script that wants to use our model, they can just send a request with new data and we can send them back the predicted outcome. That's what we want to accomplish here. So let's actually, I'm going to flip over here to RStudio now and let's go ahead and let's build this out. Okay, so we, what we want to do is we want to load the Plumber package. And then before I do anything else, um, let's, let's just kind of make sure that we've got the pieces in place that we want to have in place. So what I'm going to do first here is I'm going to create, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. I'm going to create just a, a single endpoint that all it does is just verifies that things are working. It's not going to do anything other than just return some information that says, hey, the lights are on, things seem to be working. So we'll call this, um, we'll write the function here, if I could type. And we'll say we want to return a list. And we want to say, okay, the status is that all is good. And then we'll return the time just so we can verify that this is working the way that it that it should. Okay. And if I and if I run this function, we could call this function um, status or something like that. And if I run this function in R, we can see what I get back. I get back this list and it tells me the status is all good and it gives me this timestamp of when that when that function executed. And now what I want to do is I want to turn this into a, an API endpoint. So we'll give it a little description here. We'll say, um, we'll call this help check. Um, we'll just call this health check, right? Is the API running? Okay, so that's our description. And then this will respond to uh, get requests at the help check panel, right? So I've taken, I've, I've written my function, and now all I'm doing is I'm adding these special comments that we saw before that tell Plumber what to do with this function, right? What do I wanna do? Well, I wanna call it health check. This is the title and description I'm gonna give it. And then here's the important piece that says, okay, whenever a get request comes in, and I'm not gonna get into what different request types are and things like that, that's, that's an exercise for another time, but essentially if a request comes into this location, then return, the results of this function. Execute this function and return the results. And, and if we save this, we can click Run API here, and we'll see over here on the right-hand side, we've got this little interface that shows up that allows us to see, okay, we've got this health check. Let me expand this out a little bit so we can see, all right? So here I've got this get health check. It tells me the description of the, of the endpoint, which is what we provided right here, is the API running, health check is the API running, and we can try this out. Let's come in and try this out. There's no parameters. I don't need to provide any parameters here. So I can just execute this. And here I see my response body and I can see directly, in fact, let's see if we can make this a little easier to compare. If I scroll up, up here, there we go. Here's the result of my function in R, right? We, we ran the function in R and that's what we see. And here is the result when I make a request, an API request to this endpoint. And hopefully you can see the connection between the two, right? I hear up, up top, I've got an R list that was created that tells me the status and the time. And here down below, I have that same list, except now it's just in JSON format. 
which is the, the kind of the industry standard for how these APIs communicate. Now you can adjust how this, what type of response this an API generates, and we'll look at that here in a little bit. But by default, Plumber will take the output of your function and convert it to JSON, and that JSON data will be returned to the client. So here's what we here's what we saw returned to the client. And basically, what this says is, okay, we have this working, right? Plumber's working. We're able to see that the API is running. We can try this out again if we wanted to, right? We could execute this again, and we see the same result, but the timestamp is now updated to reflect the current time, which in my local time is 11:23 a.m. All right, we're going to stop the API and now we're going to keep going. So this this makes sure that okay, we've got all the pieces in place, we know what we're doing. Now let's figure out okay, what do we really want to do? What's our goal here? Well, first of all, I need the model. So I've I've already saved the model. We'll just read the model in. Um, we'll say model is read. Um, Model, okay, so I've got this model odd file that I've already saved. We can read this in here, All right? So we've got our model. And now what I wanna be able to do is I wanna say, okay, what if I if I predict my, my model and I say new data is, and I've got some JSON data lying around. So we'll say free JSON penguins. Okay, and I'll say type equals prop, okay. So let's see. Oh, we need to do. There we go. All right. So now if I look at this and I'll walk through what we did here, but if I look, what I really want is I want to say, okay, given my model that I already trained, I want to be able to give it some new data and return the predicted outcomes. So in this case, what I'm returning is I'm returning a, pre uh, a probability value for each of the three different species, right? So in this case, Penguin 1 has a strong, we're, we're almost entirely confident in this Gen 2. Um, prediction 2, or observation 2, we're very strongly predicting that it's a deli, so on and so forth. I can see the breakdown across each potential outcome or each potential species here in my output. So this works. This is, I mean, this is how I would generate new predictions in R. But what I really want is I really want this functionality to take place in an API. I want somebody to be able to just pass me some data and then I can pass them back the predicted outcomes like like what I'm doing here in R. So this is this is our goal right here. Our goal is to do this is to have this kind of behavior in an API endpoint. So we've got our model in place. We'll need to let's bring in we've got a couple of other um, packages that we'll need to make sure that, that they're available in our environment here just for the model. So we need to bring in the parsenet package for the predict function to work the right the way that we want it to and this is all because of how we train the model and then we want to bring in the ranger package because we trained this model using the ranger package so so this is again just to remind ourselves this is a random forest model that we built we saved it out and now we're going to use it in this api that we're building okay i've got these pieces in place so now what i want is i want to say okay i've got a function and uh, and what i want to be able to do is i want to say okay i want to predict i've already got my model because I've loaded that in my environment. So I've got, I've got my model and then I've got new data. And this is the part, okay, now I've got to figure this out because where is this data going to come from, right? I, I don't have, like, like when I run this as an API, I want this data to come from the user, right? This is, the, this, is, this is data that comes from the client request, okay? So, okay, let's think about how that works. The way that this works in Plumber is I'm going to have, I'm going to write my function so that it takes a couple of arguments, uh, request, req, and response, res. And what this does, if I write my function this way, it allows me to have access to the full request that's being made from within my function. Plumber will automatically pass that, that request object into my function, and then I have access to it. And one of the cool things with Plumber, with the, with the latest release of Plumber, is that you, you can automatically parse incoming um, data and make it available in the request itself. So, so for example, if I have a user that makes a request with some JSON data and says, "Okay, here's here's some here's some information about some new penguins we found, and I want to know what their what their species is." So they make this request. Plumber will automatically take that JSON data, convert it to a data frame, and make it available for me to use within the body of this function that I'm writing right now. 
So all we need to know is we need to know, okay, well, what, what, like, where, where does that get stored? And it gets stored as the request, as, as part of the request, and it gets stored as the body object attached to this incoming request. And in fact, we're, we'll take a look at that in just a moment. But this is this is essentially what I want to be able to do. I want to say, okay, let's do this, and let's say um, type is probability, like we saw before, right? We're just we're just taking this this function that was our goal, and we're we're now putting it inside this function that we're going to use within our API. So we're going to say this is going to be predict species for new penguins. Okay. And then this is, let's say we want to um, respond to post requests at the predict endpoint. Okay, excellent. Let's um let's let's go ahead and run this. I'm gonna go I'm gonna go ahead and comment this out just because this isn't a necessary piece of what we're doing. This is just so that we know what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, we're gonna run this API, and let's pop this open over here. Okay. So we see our health check. Let's just verify that that's doing what we think it should be. And it looks like it is, which is great. That means everything's working on the plumber side as far as we know. And then let's take a look at our predict endpoint here. Okay, we've got this predict endpoint. We'll try it out. Okay, uh, execute. Okay, we get some sort of error here. Hmm, okay. And if we look at this, this is just an R error that's come back to us in JSON format, right? Which is, again, a nice kind of feature of a plumber is that if my R code throws an error, um, I can capture that error and I can gracefully return something to the user. Or if I don't capture it or do anything like that, then plumber will automatically take that error message, convert it into JSON, and return it back to the user so they get some idea of what's going on. And what's really happening here is, I, like, I didn't give this any data. So this is saying, look, I didn't find, you know, one or more independent variables was not found. Um, like I didn't find any data. And, and that actually makes sense because I didn't, I didn't give it any data in here, right? Like I didn't, there wasn't any part of this where I like provided it with some sample data. Um, and so now I've got to figure out, okay, well, how do I, how can I provide some sample data here? Right. And one of the one of the features that's new to Plumber is the ability to modify the user interface that that appears okay so we saw this user interface that showed up over here in fact let me just run this one more time so we can see it right so i've got this user interface that appears over here this is really really nice because it means that as an r user when i'm building my api and i run it i get a nice really clean way to interact with the api directly from within our studio right right here in our studio i can check to see that my api is working and here we go right Things are working. I can check this endpoint. But as we just saw, if I try to do something like check this endpoint, all of a sudden I'm in a little bit of a bind because there's nothing here that allows me to pass in data. So what I really would like is I'd like some way to say, okay, like how can I like can I just plop some JSON in here, right? Like instead of instead of not being able to do anything, what if I could just drop some JSON into here and and run it that way? And with the newest release of Plumber, that is entirely possible. So that entire user interface that we were just looking at is built around something called the Open API specification. Now, the entire Open API specification is a massive standardization, standardized format for defining API behavior and endpoints and things like that. I am not going to spend a lot of time going into the entirety of what open API is and all that, that entails. Um, you're certainly welcome to look more into that on your own. But what it means for us as our users and as plumber users is that if we want to enhance the capability of our of our user interface here, we can do so by doing one of two things. We can either modify it directly in R um, with, by, by modifying a, a, a list, a massive list, or we can provide our own specification file and use that from within R. And so that's that's what we're going to do here. And I'll, I'll show you what this looks like. So I'm going to create another little section here. And we're going to call this at plumber. This is another new feature of the package. And basically what this special tag does is it allows me to take my existing plumber object and modify it however I want. Okay. So I'm no longer defining an endpoint, but rather what I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, after I've done all this stuff, so after I've added health check, after I've added predict, I wanna further modify this object that's being created. And so I'm gonna say, this is a function of, and we'll call it PR for my plumber router. 
and then in here I can modify what what I want to do to this PR object. And and this gives me another chance to unveil one more really great feature of the newest release of Plumber, and that is I can now do something like this: PR pipe PR set API spec. And I want to say, okay, let's. I've got this YAML file that I'm going to read, and I'll show you what this file looks like in just a moment here. Um, okay, so let's. Before we look at this YAML file, let's look at what we're doing here. I'm saying, okay, plumber, take this information and start building me an API router. But now that you've built these pieces, so you've got this endpoint, you've got this endpoint. I want to do something else to it. I want to take that router and I want to add this API specification file, right? And so what I can do here is I can either provide a named list, which this will do, or I can modify the existing specification that Plumber is already building for me. Either one works. I kind of like this approach because it allows me to lay out the whole outline of what I want, uh, and that can be helpful, but either one works. So if we look at this open API file here, this is a YAML file that just contains information about the API. And notice I define like the summary for my health check. I define the summary for predict. And if I run this now, we come back over here to my plumber file and we run this, you'll notice that my descriptions have now changed, right? My health check says determine if the API is running and listening as expected. And notice that here, my description says health check is the API running. Well, why are those two things different? They're different because I overwrite in this YAML file what that description should be. Notice in here, I say, determine if the API is running and listening as expected, and that is what we see listed in, in my interface, okay? So I have if effectively overwritten some of what I already did by providing this new definition file. But in addition to overwriting some of that information, I've also described that I wanna be able to pass in JSON data to this predict endpoint. And so if I come over here and open this up, it tells me here, look, the request body should be JSON. And here's an example of what that JSON data should look like. And if I try this out, I can come in here and I can edit this. I could say, well, what if we said 5110 or what if we said 5440 or 5540, whatever the case is, right? I can come in and I can pass my own data into this endpoint now and try it out, right? We can execute this. And here we see that we have once again an internal error. And this is because if we come back over to our API file for just a moment, we're passing in only a single value and it's being parsed as a vector instead of a data frame. So if we just change this one piece and say we want this to be a data frame, now let's run the API one more time. Try this out. Here's our data that we're passing in. Let's execute on that data. And here we see our response is a JSON object that contains the predicted probability for each associate species. So in this case, this particular penguin is almost a toss up, right? We're not super sure which one it is. It may be it's chin strap, but it's, it's a fairly even split across all three potential outcomes here. And what's great about this is now we have exactly what we were describing originally, right? If I come back up here for just a moment, and look at what my goal was, right? I want to I want to enable an external user to give me some data, and then I want to be able to return to them the associated likelihood that that particular set of data matches up with each of the three species that are our potential outcomes. And that's exactly what I've done here. Now to recap, right? Just to revisit this this idea one more time, we have specified our own specification file, this YAML file, that identifies all the details of how this user interface should be laid out. And that's where I can, that's what, that's what enables me to have the ability to input the JSON data needed to generate a response from this endpoint. Okay, so all from within our studio itself, I'm able to build my API and I'm able to come over here and verify that that API is working the way that it, that it needs to. Okay, that's been a little bit to swallow. I know that's, you know, maybe we've, we've gotten into some detail that we didn't necessarily need to or want to get into, but I think it's useful to understand how some of these pieces work. Is it necessary to change the API specification file? No. Is it something that you have to do? No, right? You can, you can do this. You can operate just fine without it. Um, 
Now, granted, that might mean that you need to find some other way to make a request to your API um, to verify that your predict endpoint is working the way that you expect. Um, but there are lots of tools that that work that that'll enable you to interact with APIs in a really nice kind of clean interface. Uh, Postman is one that I use regularly, and there are several others that exist as well that allow you to generate requests and see responses and things like that. So do you need to make these modifications? No, but if you want to, you certainly can. Um, let's take a look at one more thing here that I think is, is again, maybe a little bit extra, but I think it's, it's useful to know. The default interface, I'm gonna run this API one more time. The default interface here is Swagger. And I see that up here in the top left of the corner. This is the Swagger interface. Um, Swagger has been around for quite a while. Um, Open API, the specification kind of grew out of some of the efforts that, that went into Swagger and everything like that. But essentially now what we have is Swagger is a, is a will interpret my specification and give me this interface. Okay? There are other alternatives to Swagger that exist today that do the same thing, that, that create an interface for me to use. And now within Plumber, given the latest release, it's entirely possible to use one of those other systems instead of using Swagger itself. So for example, if I wanted to use, there's a, there's a uh, library or a, a viewer called Rapidoc. So if I wanted to use Rapidoc, I could come in here. There's an R package, it's not released on CRAN. Uh, it's only on GitHub at this point, but there's an R package called Rapidoc that I could install here, or that I could load here. And then further down, I could say, let's do PR set docs. And we'll say docs is Rapidoc, okay? We'll save these changes. And now if I come back and run my API again, you'll see that my interface looks different. I have the same functionality, right? I can open up this one. I can try this out. I can see the response. I can open up this one, come in here. I can see the example data. I can try this out. We see the response, right? So again, my functionality remains the same, but maybe I have a preference over which particular UI I use when I'm experimenting with and, and, and working with my APIs and you have the flexibility now in Plumber to be able to define those. Uh, one more thing that I wanna look at here is while we've got this open, we have this built-in example here that gives us a sing the measurements for a single penguin, but I've also got this Java, or excuse me, this, this JSON data here that contains measurements for several penguins. And if we copy this in here and try this out, we'll see that our response now includes predicted output for all the penguins that I provided input for, right? So I now have this long, JSON object that contains all the information for the penguins that I provided. Okay, let's look at one more thing here. Let's come back into my um, plumber file and let's say, okay, instead of JSON though, let's say I just, I really want, I really want CSV data to come out of this, right? So we could say at serializer CSV, this tells plumber, look, when you return the output of this function, don't return it as, as JSON, return it as a CSV file. And if I run this again, or return this as CSV data, and if I run this again and try this, let's bring in all of our observations again. You can see now, instead of this JSON object, I have comma separated values for my response, right? So I can adjust what specifically is returned to the client from within here. Okay, we're gonna take a step back from this for a moment. We'll revisit our API here in just a minute. Let's go ahead and, and stop this. We'll save these changes here. Um, and let's come back to our, to our slides. Okay, so just to recap and, and kind of summarize what we looked at here. Several new features have landed in the Plumber package with the latest release. The tidy interface, so, so the ability to build your APIs by piping from one command to the next is new. Um, we, we barely touched on that, but that's something that you can explore more if you're interested. Um, the ability to automatically parse, in, parse the incoming request body so that it's available for downstream execution is new, which we saw that when we said, okay, the request body contains the parsed values that we're getting from the client. Uh, there's support for new serializers and the way that you define serializers is greatly simplified. Uh, the open API specification we looked at, you can adjust that in a couple of different ways by either providing your own file or by modifying the existing list that R is working with. You can customize the UI. So instead of using Swagger, which is the default, you can use Rapidoc, you could use Redoc. There's a, a handful of different uh, custom UIs you can use. And last but not least, Plum, the Plumber Hex logo has gotten a facelift. 
Uh, this was on the title slide, so you've probably already come across it, but there's the new plumber logo that um, that accompanies this, this update that's happening. Okay, so now we've got this API, it's running, it's doing what we want, we've mission accomplished, right? We're able to take in some data, we're able to generate predictions, we're able to return that data back to the client. All is good, except for one thing, we are still the bottleneck, right? Like this is like, I'm just working off of my laptop right now. And so when I'm running this API, it's just running locally here on my own machine. And that works for development purposes and testing purposes. But what happens when I now want to say, look, Sarah in engineering is ready to make a request to this API. Well, I don't want my laptop to always to be the one thing that's servicing these requests. I need some way to deploy this so that it's, in, a, in an environment where it's always listening and available to clients that are trying to make that request. Again, whether those clients are other parts of my organization, or maybe I've built an API that's just generally publicly available and is being used by who knows who. There are a couple of options that exist for deploying Plumber APIs. Uh, RStudio Connect is a professional product that's developed and, and built by RStudio that allows for easy deployment of Plumber APIs. We'll look at an example of that here in just a moment. Um, you can deploy, you can wrap up these APIs inside of a Docker container and then deploy them into an environment that's suitable for that type of deployment. Uh, and then there's some nice kind of helper functions that used to exist in the Plumber package and have now been offloaded to a new package called Plumber Deploy that allow you to easily deploy to DigitalOcean. And that, that package may evolve to include other deployment endpoints as well. So we've got a, a host of different options. I wanna spend a, a couple of minutes just to talk about RStudio Connect as, as one potential way of deploying these Plumber APIs. Uh, RStudio Connect is, like I mentioned, it's a professional product that we create and develop here at RStudio. It allows for easy push button deployment of things created in R and Python. It handles dependency management, so all of your packages and dependencies come along for the ride. It allows you to adjust how your API scales, how it responds to concurrent requests, how new processes are generated, things of that nature. It integrates with Git and GitHub so that you can automatically deploy from repositories. You can specify who has permission and authentication to access things like APIs and, and dashboards and, and things like that. And then, like I said, in addition to Plumber, you can also publish R Markdown documents and reports, Shiny applications, Jupyter Notebooks, Flask, Dash, Streamlit Python applications, and other additional, uh, other additional pieces of content. And if you'd like to learn more, uh, you can visit our, our website, rstudio.com slash product slash connect, which details what our Studio Connect is and, and provides a little bit of additional context. But what I'd like to do now is I'd like to, to take a look at our Studio Connect. So if I come here, um, this is our Studio Connect. Uh, let's come in to kind of the landing page here. So here's what I see when I come into our Studio Connect, something like this. And let's let's go through the process of publishing this API that we built. Now I've set up this API that we built in in um, in our studio to be publishable via Git. So if I come in here and say, okay, let's let's import this from a Git repository. Let's pull in the repository name. So that is um, let's see. Okay, so here's the repository for that. I had to find it really quick. Um, so github.com, I've got this repository that I keep talks and things that I do in, and then this is the Plumber Webinar 2020 repository. Click next here. This will look to see what branches are available. I've only got a single branch available there right now. Click next, and then this will look for deployable subdirectories. In this case, we only have one. Um, it's looking for this manifest file that I previously created, and then we'll call this um, Plumber Tangoids. Okay deploy content, and now this is deploying our content. There we go. Let's open this up and see what it looks like. Okay, so here we have our API running. Uh, I can open this up and say, okay, let's, you know, anybody can come in here and view this if they want to. Um, here's my health check. Let's verify that this is working. Looks like it is. Gives me back the information that I expect. Let's check out our our other endpoint, our predict endpoint, it looks like it's doing what we want it to do. There we go. We see our CSV output here and all is well and good, right? I've got everything, everything is, is working the way that I expect it to. And just to kind of illustrate this, right? If I, so one one way to, to quickly and easily demonstrate how an external 
either tool or framework or language can make a request to this API, if I open this API up here, um, there we go. Let's take a look at this. So now I've, I've opened this up so that it's just open kind of in its own isolated environment. And if I, instead of going to docs, go to health check, I and mean, this might be a little small to see and I apologize, but I'm just visiting the URL and then adding health check to the end of it. And basically what this means is my browser is now going to make a request to the health check endpoint. And if we do this, my browser shows me the JSON that's coming back from that health check endpoint. So without any sort of like fancy bells and whistles, I've just now made a request to this API from my web browser, and I'm now seeing the results of that request rendered here in, in front of us. Okay, so last thing that I wanna highlight here before we wrap things up. All is well and good, right? My API is running, I can give other developers or other teams within my organization, I can give them the information they need to make requests to this API, they can make those requests, my API will respond back to them, and all is good. But now let's say, okay, I publish this, it's great, and then I get an email in a couple of days that says, look, we, we started using and interacting with your API, uh, we noticed that it's giving us back uh, comma-separated values, right? And we'd really prefer to get JSON. Like, we can parse the CSV data, but our platform's built around JSON. Could you provide us with JSON as a response instead of these comma-separated values? And, and we've already seen how to do that, right? If we come back into our studio here and, and take a look, right? If we come, if we take this serializer and say, instead of CSV, let's just do JSON. And, and JSON's the default, right? So if I deleted this whole thing, it would still be JSON. But we could we could save this change, and we say, okay, we're gonna re, we're gonna return JSON data here. Um, let's go ahead and save that, and then let's come in to if I can pull it open. There we go. Let's come in to Git and make and commit this change. We'll say, okay, we're gonna uh, we're gonna uh, update to JSON serialization. Okay, commit that. We'll go ahead and push this change to GitHub. And now let's go ahead and grab our big collection of penguins. And if we come back over here, our Studio Connect will check every 15 minutes or so by default to see what changes have been made to the repository. Um, but I, I'm also just gonna kind of manually kick it off and say, okay, let's just check for any updates in the repository. Hey, some changes were found. We're gonna redeploy this. Okay, we're ready to go. And now if I come in and try this endpoint out, we'll change our example to include all this, we can see that my response is now JSON instead of CSV. And I didn't have to do anything. All I did was make a change and commit that change to my GitHub repository like I normally do in my regular workflow. And RStudio Connect will automatically pick up on that change, redeploy the content and make it available so that I can make the change, push it to GitHub and email that developer back and say, it should be fixed now. You should now be able to receive JSON. All right, so in conclusion, uh, if you're interested in learning more about Plumber and the tools that we've talked about today, here's a whole list of resources you can go to visit. Uh, the first list, the first resource listed here is the Plumber website, uh, and then a bunch of different GitHub repositories. So the Plumber GitHub repository, if you run into like issues or questions with the package, uh, you can go there to see if, if that issue has already been uh, submitted, or you can submit your own issue. Uh, this second repository listed here is a collection of just example APIs to kind of build from if you are looking for some examples to get started with. Uh, Plumber Deploy, I briefly mentioned, currently has the DigitalOcean functions for deploying to DigitalOcean. This Rapidoc repository is something we use today so that we could change the user interface that we saw with Plumber. Uh, the material that we looked at today, so the example files and everything like that, the slides, will be made available at the webinars GitHub repository that's listed here. So look for that to, to be uh, published there shortly. Uh, and then the community, the RStudio community site has a, a plumber group or a, a plumber tag that you can follow if you're interested in questions being asked about plumber or if you have questions on your own that you'd like to ask to the community, you can do so there. And then finally, um, our, our studio has our global uh, conference coming up in, in January. Uh, Barrett, who's again joined us today, is, is going to be presenting some additional new functionality with Plumber and asynchronous execution at that. And that's an entirely virtual conference. 
that you can attend and I would encourage you to attend as well, especially if you're interested in asynchronous plumber execution as that is what Barrett is going to be, be speaking about there. Uh, and then finally, just thank you again for your time, for joining us today. I, I've appreciated this opportunity to present on Plumber and all the new features that we've added to the package. We're really excited about the work that's being done. If you have questions, if you have you know things you want to discuss, feel free to reach out. Um, reach out on our studio community. I monitor that site quite frequently and respond to, to questions or comments that are posted there. Uh, and again, just from all of us here at our studio, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, I think we've got a, a couple of minutes here for questions. And so I'm gonna kind of pause and pull open the questions here to see if there's anything that um, that remains to be answered. Uh, there's a question that came in that says, are there any suggested suggested tools or packages to integrate security uh, to secure access to APIs? Really good question. There's not anything on like the R package standpoint that I've really tested. I know that a while ago, and I'm trying to remember the name, I came across a group that was building an R package that the goal was to provide security, some security functionality for Plumber APIs. I haven't revisited that in quite a while. And in fact, like I said, I don't quite remember what the name of that repository or package was going to be. So I don't know where things ended up there. I don't know how far that made it. Um, because of Plumber's flexibility, you can handle like security and and authentication and things like that yourself. It, it becomes, a, I, I don't want to say tricky, but it just, you have to think carefully about it to make sure that you don't leave yourself open to like security vulnerabilities. But you could certainly, for example, have a filter in place that says, look, if a, if a request is made without a specific header or without a specific token, then that, that doesn't get passed through. That request gets rejected and, and 404 is out or something like that. Um, you can certainly do that on your own within Plumber, but there's no, like I said, to my knowledge, there's no kind of out of the box package or, or tool that does that for you. That being said, RStudio Connect does have um, API key-based authentication. So if I, for example, take my, let me just come back here for just a minute. If I take my, my little API here and, set it, and instead said, look, you have to log in to view this, then that would require users to submit a request with an API key as one of their headers. And RStudio Connect will verify that key and verify that the key belongs to a user that is allowed permission to this API and then pass that through. But again, that's something that's enforced on the RStudio Connect level and not being enforced at the Plumber level. Plumber is still just responding as usual. RStudio Connect is acting as the gatekeeper in front of it to filter out requests that are invalid. It's a great question. Uh, can you completely customize the look of the API that makes it look prettier for users? Are you stuck with the templates you showed? So those templates, so uh, we looked at Swagger, we looked at Rapidoc. Those are based off of the open API specification. Basically what those do, those are frameworks that take that open API specification, which was basically that big YAML file we looked at, and then generate a UI layer on top of it. And then the nice thing about Plumber is it connects that UI layer to the underlying R process that's running the API, right? So I've got this nice direct, direct link between, okay, I've got this API running and now I can interact with it like we see here, right? I've got this nice sort of UI layer. Um, I'm not, like, I don't have a lot of experience with each of those individual pieces. So for example, we're using Rapidoc here, right? I don't know how customizable the look and feel of this particular framework is. There, I, I do know that there are a handful of frameworks that exist today and there's kind of more being created you know, almost it feels like all the time. Um, and so it's possible that some may provide additional flexibility. I don't, I don't entirely know the answer to that particular question. Uh, can Plumber dictate rate limits? Another excellent question, not out of the box. There's nothing specific in Plumber where you can specify like, you know, an a, a rate limit tag or setting or anything like that. You could build in rate limiting yourself. It would require some additional legwork because you'd have to have some way of identifying, you know, how are you rate limiting? Are you rate limiting to a specific user? And then you'd have some sort of cache where you keep track of what their rate limit or what their current consumption is and then check that consumption against the limit that they've been given and, and provide messaging around that limit. You can build all that in a plumber. I'm not saying that it's not possible. I'm just saying there's not anything built in that allows you to rate limit, but you could certainly build that functionality into your APIs by using tools that Plumber provides. Okay, yes. Okay, so once deployed, how do you submit the new data to the model API? It seems unwieldy to just like pass in a giant browser URL. Totally correct, right? In most cases, these APIs aren't gonna be interacted with via a web browser, but rather 
somebody else. So you maybe you've got a front end developer that's that's writing JavaScript, or you've got a mobile app developer developing in Swift, or whatever the case is. All of these frameworks have their own libraries, packages, tools for building and sending API requests, and those developers would often do that. So for example, as an R user, the HTTR package is what you would use to build a request. So if you were an R user submitting a request to, you, I could submit a request to this to this API we just built, right? I could use the HTTR package to build that request, including the the new data that's going to be passed to the to the predict endpoint and and send that request over, and then the response will come back, and I could work with it from there. So in most cases, the nice thing is when you start talking about APIs, most developers. Uh, will we'll understand kind of how to work with that, and they'll have their own framework that they use for sending requests. And, and the nice thing is, those requests will all be formatted the same way because HTTP is a standard format. So your API, it doesn't matter if the request is coming from an R script using HTTR, if it's coming from Python using the request module, it doesn't matter if it's coming from Golang, it doesn't matter if it's, it doesn't matter. The request comes in, the API executes and returns the response. Um, and, and lots of frameworks have their own way of, of making those requests. Okay, um, last question that I'll answer here in the last minute that we've got, what is the advantage of using an R API versus Shiny apps? Uh, really good question. Uh, Shiny applications are really best suited for like human interaction, right? So if I've got a Shiny application, I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna interact with it as an individual, right? As a, as a API, it's not necessarily expected that users are gonna come in here and interact with the API this way. They might do it a little bit, right? Just to kind of check some things, but in most cases, an API is going to be interacted with programmatically. So I might build a Plumber API so that another tool that my company developed can use my model or can use the business logic that I've implemented in my API. I might use a Shiny app so that another user can view my model, if that makes sense, right? So the, the, the distinction here is who's the end user. In one case for Shiny, it's another human that's interacting with my application. For APIs, it's most like another tool that's interacting with with my application or with my API.